Still reeling from the terrifying broadcast and images, Emily's instincts kick in before her mind can catch up, as her previous aversions are cast aside in an instant. Where ransacking her neighbor's homes had been a distant concept past Grant's and Lucy's, she now began to accept the reality of her isolation, and the fact that those she once waved at in the morning wouldn't be returning. Entering the home she had heard the mindless bashing from previously, the tense doctor discovers the sorry state of her next door neighbor Anne, though avoids dwelling on her mangled body, and the question of where her two kids were as she begins to empty the kitchen. Thankfully discovering a satchel to help carry the food and some improvised first aid materials, Emily leaves the eerily quiet residence feeling uneasy and wrong. The items she now limped back to her own home with weren't hers. She hadn't purchased them, she hadn't asked for them, but they were necessary and now unclaimed. Finding some solace in cooking the stew Anne had left prepared in her kitchen, Emily tries to believe that some small part of the now dead woman lived on, but each bite of beef only caused a struggling survivor's guilt to pile higher and higher. Finally deciding how to give Anne's death some meaning, Emily collects her worn notebook and pushes herself back into the devastated home. Subject, 005. Age 30s, sex female, name Anne. Cause of death, self-inflicted cranial trauma. Notes, multiple severe lacerations that appear to have occurred post-mortem. Minimal bleeding. Hoping to avoid the discovery of more infected neighbors, the tentative scavenger begins to work her way down the street, always staying vigilant amongst the incredible silence. Still opting to avoid the infected when she can, Emily surrenders the home to the mindless growling and distant thumping as she shifts to an unguarded source of food. Letting slip a sliver of a smile as she finally finds gloves, her delight is snuffed out as she discovers another firearm and acknowledges her need to collect it. <sighs> Beginning to question how many would have to die in defense of her home and her life, Emily once again leans on the crutch she had formed and turns the tragedy into some semblance of purpose as her notebook finds its way into her hand yet again. Subject, 006. Subject has heavily worn shoes, inconsistent with other articles of clothing, indicating he had traveled a great distance, dead or alive. It seems like every hour brings more infected, and without the ability to run, the corpses are beginning to pile up. With what I've seen on the TV, and the fact that population centers are the last place you want to be for scenarios such as this, I've decided that I have to make my way out of Louisville. It doesn't sound as though anywhere else is safe, but the country will provide a more stable situation, along with being able to check on my parents and confirm. Knowing that I'm not walking out of here with the state of my leg, I'm committed to finding a nearby source of fuel in the morning. All I can hope for now is that my route out of the city hasn't been blocked by the rioting or the herds I've seen on the TV. Surprised by a gaunt face shambling through the dim light, Emily fumbles with her pistol until she can finally put down the infected, though multiple growls cause her heart to race and her hands to shake. Yes! 
witnessing her gunfire beginning to fill her once empty streets with more curious dead, the tense doctor retreats back through her home in hopes of sneaking away, but is faced with the tireless horrors invading her once quiet suburb. Not willing to bring even more down around her home, the resourceful doctor remembers a screwdriver impaled in her first victim, now wielding the bloody and slippery handle in her gloved hands. Adrenaline pumping as she murders someone with her hands for the first time, Emily uses the intense momentum to face down the next infected, feeling sick of the sense of accomplishment she now feels with her slim freedom. Checking the house across the street with the safety she had secured, she finds that her neighbors had left nothing behind during their evacuation, which turns Emily's minds back to pursuing her own flight from Louisville. Limping painfully down the deserted roads and leering at the loitering infected surrounding the homes, the desperate doctor begins to check each vehicle she comes across until her effort finally pays off. Gasoline now sloshing in her can as she makes the trudge back towards home, Emily begins to formulate a list of what she has to pack before she leaves, excited and hopeful to finally be free of this gradually crushing prison. Emptying the fuel into her car when she returns, the strained survivor acknowledges her quickly approaching limits as her leg aches and her eyes grow heavy. This is a recorded broadcast. It will be set to repeat. An unknown plague known as the Knox infection has taken a hold on America. If you are still alive, if the fever didn't get to you, it all rests on you. Please, find a way to survive. Please. While I shouldn't be surprised, the fact that the news has resorted to automatic broadcasts terrifies me. I haven't stopped to think about how much damage the world has sustained, and I need to keep those thoughts far away until I have time for them. But it's hard not to fester on it. All the dead. All the dying. I'm glad I'm leaving Louisville tomorrow. I know this nightmare won't stop once I escape, but anything is better than steadily stacking my neighbors in my backyard. They deserve better. Emily. Piling all of her accumulated food into her satchel, as her leg still throbs from all it had been put through yesterday, Emily pictures the open fields surrounding her childhood home, dreaming of the security it would bring compared to the dense and cluttered environment of the city. Turning the ignition over for the first time in weeks, the persistent annoyance of her injured leg rears up once again as her pain and anxiety begins to mount with alarming speed. Finding roads blocked and hungry infected closing in at every turn, Emily's heart threatens the thunder out of her chest as her vision grows hazy with fear and her desperation hurls her back in the direction of her only safety. Terrified she had now caused a herd of undead to follow her back to her home, the shaken woman stares down the empty street before once again retreating into the cold and protective arms of her cramped prison. Finally working her way down from the terror that had come from her attempted escape, Emily's mind instinctively distracts itself by putting her to work. Pulling out and sketching a rough map of her neighborhood, her brain works to remember each notable landmark she had spotted amongst the dead. 
While she had heard the chaos of the infection from her home, it was another thing entirely to see her community shambling about mindlessly, and the roads barricaded with abandoned cruisers. Now confident that she simply wasn't driving her way out of the city, Emily unloads the supplies she had gathered and turns her attention to her security once more. Oh. <laughs> 